My name is Adam Levenbrook. I'm pre recording this and sharing it with the neurologist in Cairo. This is a talk on my experience with the autonomic evaluation in practice. Um, autonomic neurology has taken over my practice here in Minneapolis, where I'm a professor at the university and work with uh, fellows and trainees and work mostly in a community clinical care setting at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis. Uh, just to introduce autonomic neurology, probably began around 200 AD. This is a picture of Galen, the Greek physician who was living under the Roman Empire. He argued against the understanding of the time put forth by Socrates that the heart was the source of consciousness. Um, he argued that the nerves and the consciousness emanated from the brain. Um, he had done dissections and seen plexuses that supplied all the organs of the chest and abdomen and found the sympathetic chain running along the spinal cord. And he determined that these nerves were hollow tubes that conveyed life and the human spirit to the organs, um, creating sympathy between the organs. Um, the autonomic pathways in the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system um, span the whole body. Um, any segment of the central or peripheral nervous system can have autonomic dysfunction as a feature. So autonomic dysfunction is ubiquitous in, in neurologic disease involving any segment of the nervous system. Um, in the um, subcortical lesions affecting the hypothalamus, um, brainstem, spinal cord, um, can include trauma, very commonly tumors, multiple sclerosis, stroke, ischemia, autoimmune disease. Uh, there are diseases that affect the entire neuraxis, uh, such as synucleinopathies or autoimmune diseases that can affect all neurons in the body. Um, more famously, peripheral nerve disease um, causes autonomic neuropathy, autonomic dysfunction as part of, as part of neuropathy, um, diabetes most commonly, um, amyloidosis famously has heavy involvement of autonomic function in peripheral neuropathy caused by amyloidosis, possibly because of special sensitivity of unmyelinated autonomic nerves to buildup of amyloid. Um, other famous autonomic neuropathies include Sjogren's, which can cause a small fiber predominant neuropathy or perineoplastic neuropathies these are the short list of peripheral neuropathies we think of when we meet someone who has predominant autonomic neuropathy or small fiber neuropathy where their EMG or their neurologic exam might be largely normal, but their symptoms are extensive. So the autonomic nerves, because they permeate all of the organ systems in the body, the manifestations of autonomic neurologic dysfunction can mimic um, the, the functions of all of those organs. So any of the symptoms that localize to the organs, you can have intestinal dysfunction or symptoms, diarrhea, constipation, postprandial bloating, regurgitation. It can be very confusing. Cardiac dysfunction with a tendency for blood pressure drop when you go from supine to upright is most common. Fainting, syncope, 
um, urinary dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, light sensitivity, uh, glandular dysfunction, but most famously dizziness. Um, dizziness is called caused by um, hypoperfusion of the brain when upright, uh, that autoregulation of cerebral vasculature is altered, is dysfunctional, so that autoregulation of brain perfusion cannot compensate for the shifting gravitational pull on intravascular blood when going from supine to standing. Um, but the, the symptoms associated with it can mimic any part of the nervous system and really any organ in the body. It can be confusing. So what are the hallmarks? How do we discern autonomic neurologic dysfunction from other illnesses? It comes up all the time in clinical practice. It can be really confusing. Patients can be passed from specialist to specialist or lost in primary care settings. The autonomic evaluation, what do we accomplish? What can, what can be done? Um, firstly, is there autonomic dysfunction? Um, the most common, maybe the hallmark of autonomic dysfunction is orthostatic dizziness. What parts of the nervous system are involved? What's the distribution of the symptoms in the body? Um, that's something that we can try to, try to do. Um, is there a syndrome? You know, what kind of pattern of involvement do we have? What are the set of symptoms? If there's dizziness, is there also some other autonomic dysfunction that might help us localize to a part of the a part of the nervous system or to the nervous system at all. What's the company kept by the symptoms? Is there an etiology, an underlying cause? So there's a short list. I mentioned a few. Um, can we identify some of those? What's the severity? How bad is it? Is it early on? Is it severe? What's the prognosis? Is it changing over time? Um, can you chart a trajectory to get an idea of where things are going for the patient? What can they expect in the future? So that's the short list of things that I accomplish with a, with a clinical evaluation. The first step for me is uh, an autonomic reflex screen. And in my lab, we reproduce the autonomic testing done at Mayo Clinic where I did my training, my subspecialty training. We can't test every part of the nervous system, of the autonomic nervous system, but there are certain quantifiable reflexes that we can see um, and uh, evaluate qualitatively as well um, with this autonomic reflex screen. We can extrapolate from the results. Um, some of the parts of this are quantitative, some of them are qualitative. And the quantitative parts are compared against a large normative database that's built into the software that we use. Some of this normative data is available um, to the public. Some of it is black box. One of the most common questions that I am getting now, especially in the last three years, is whether patients with chronic fatigue or chronic orthostatic dizziness have POTS. There are a lot of young people, but not all young. A lot of people who began having symptoms after COVID or um, even after COVID vaccination. Um, the question is always, does my patient have POTS? And most people have heard about POTS. Now most neurologists know about POTS. Um, but 
I would say many neurologists don't have a great understanding of the nature of POTS. Is POTS a diagnosis? Is it a symptom? I would argue that POTS is a set of contributions and symptoms. It's a constellation of, of um, symptoms and signs. It's not a primary diagnosis in anyone. There are different types that are quoted in the literature, and I would argue that they're not so much types as relatively predominant contributions to the cause. Um, for my practice, the most difficult type of uh, POTS to identify is neuropathic POTS, um, because often uh, there's not much large fiber peripheral neuropathy. There is small fiber peripheral neuropathy or simply autonomic neuropathy. Neuropathic POTS uh, with pure autonomic neuropathy can be difficult to discern from um, medication effect uh, because of sympatholytic or anticholinergic effects of a lot of psychiatric medicines, for example. So that I'll, I'll try to talk about how to identify neuropathic POTS. Hyperadrenergic POTS is possibly uh, an overused term. I think most POTS represents a hyperadrenergic state, a tendency for the body to overreact with adrenergic responses. Again, can be difficult to discern from the effects of amphetamines or different kinds of psychiatric medicines. Um, another important contributor is low blood volume. Low blood volume can also be primary if someone is um, difficulty holding on to fluid for some reason, um, diabetes insipidus, but it also generally um, falls under the category of a tendency for venous pooling in the lower limbs, dehydration, or low aldosterone states. Um, and the earlier example of low uh, of venous pooling in the legs can arise from states of deconditioning, where the musculature of the lower limbs is not functioning as well as it normally does to help with venous return from the legs toward the heart. Um, of course, if you're simply dehydrated or having a hard time holding on to fluid for different reasons, um, GI, dysfunction, chronic nausea and vomiting, this can contribute and it's something that you should ask about. Are they dehydrated for some reason? That can contribute to a, a POTS-like state Something we hear a lot about now is joint hypermobility contributing to POTS. My understanding of joint hypermobility in POTS is that um, excess elasticity of vasculature contributes to um, hyperreactive baroreflexes where the heart rate shoots up inappropriately, inappropriately in response to normal stimuli. That can arise in young people with a lot of elastin in their connective tissue um, that would also be present in blood vessels. That's the presumed link between joint hypermobility and POTS. It's just one of several contributors. And in some cases, it's the only contributor I can find, but that's rare. Usually there are at least two contributors. When there is marked deconditioning, such as in chronic fatigue or long-haul COVID, you might see reduced stroke volume, reduced left ventricular mass, and you know, so small heart syndrome. Um, and if you're able to measure it using the help of pulmonologists, you can measure peak oxygen intake. But generally, in my practice, I talk to the patient, and if they're having a lot of difficulty with fatigue and deconditioning, I would say that's likely to be one of the main contributors. And deconditioning ends up being the definitive method of treating POTS is uh, through cardiac rehabilitation. 
cardiovascular exercise. Anxiety is a famous contributor to POTS, especially when it arises in the setting of historical post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the way this functions, I can't comment on. That's above my level of expertise. Um, likely this relates to somatic hypervigilance. You're um, responding with excess adrenaline to normal stimuli, normal disturbances, standing up, walking, experiencing stress of some kind, your body overreacts with an adrenergic, sympathetic, fight-or-flight response. Another contributor people talk about is mast cell activation. In almost all cases that I see, mast cell activation is secondary to excess adrenaline. But in rare cases, people have primary mast cell activation. That can likely contribute to a POTS-like state by contributing to relative hypovolemia with um, causing third spacing of fluid or excess vasodilation with mast cell activation. It's something that people often talk about, and in almost all cases, it's, um, it's secondary, where adrenaline is activating mast cells. Mast cells are known to be reactive to adrenaline locally in the skin mostly, but also in the GI tract. Um, two common features of POTS that are almost always present are GI pain and dysmotility. Why would you have GI pain? I think that it's easily um, explained by altered um, adrenaline responses in excess fight or flight or adrenergic state would be expected to alter peristalsis, alter vagal input to the enteric nervous system. Um, migraine is another very common feature of POTS. Why is this? I think probably similarly there is abnormal, inappropriate adrenergic responsiveness and vasomotor tone affecting the meninges and the head and neck and brain um, are altered. Another very common difficult condition that I'm asked to evaluate for is synucleinopathy. Um, this falls under four main categories, Parkinson's, multiple system atrophy, Lewy body dementia, pure autonomic failure. Um, pure autonomic failure simply means that only autonomic pathways in the body, centrally and peripherally, are involved. Uh, not cerebellar, not extrapyramidal. Um, and that is uh, largely clinical. You know, if the patient has no extrapyramidal symptoms or signs, no cerebellar symptoms or signs, that's what you're left with, with someone who has autonomic failure. Autonomic failure is, of course, totally different than POTS, in POTS, there's autonomic overactivity. In pure autonomic failure, your reflexes are not working. You're having orthostatic hypotension, not orthostatic tachycardia. One of the most famous of the synucleopathies that we talk about a lot is multiple system atrophy. The top images there show the classic sign that you almost never see in the uh, pyramidal, in the Parkinsonian, um, variant, uh, which is the putaminal rim that you see here, um, whereas the hot cross bun signs are more associated with atrophy of the cerebellar fibers here in the brainstem, uh, causing the hot cross bun sign more in a cerebellar subtype. So here is the lab. It's not much uh, to show. You have a, a beat to beat blood pressure monitor. You have the hue sweat device. And you have the software heart rate monitor and the tilt table is there. The CNAP monitor is the heart of the lab. Uh, it provides uh, tracing through tandem uh, blood pressure cuffs with pulse oximetry that is equivalent to an arterial line. Um, you can see there's beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure measurement 
This is not a great absolute measurement, but more useful in measuring relative fluctuations of blood pressure. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a simple, it is a, it is a proprietary technology. We don't really know how it happens, but it was based on this Dutch guy, Jan Pinas, in 1973, his work showing that you could have pulse oximetry and a volumetric analysis of the finger to produce this um, servo loop uh, that approximates blood pressure changes like this. We measure heart rate responses to deep breathing. This is the first of the reflexes we measure. When you take a deep breath, um, the Herring-Brewer reflex mediated by the vagus nerve innervating lungs, it's a stretch reflex. Um, as you stretch the alveoli with air, um, vagus tone goes down. As you constrict them, the alveoli vagus term goes up and heart rate varies in this way. And we measure the peaks and valleys over five breaths, very slow breaths. Uh, this is normal here. You can see here's somebody with really bad diabetic neuropathy who has almost no response to the herring brewer reflex. Um, and this is important to show that over life, we lose this reflex largely. And by the time you're 80, you might have almost none. Um, that occurs whether you have diabetes or uh, not. And that's uh, divided into the red or blue. Uh, the Harry Brewer reflex is just very reliably uh, lost over the decades as we live, like a lot of neurologic function. Um, here is the Valsalva maneuver being performed. You blow into the tube. You try to blow until you get up to this line. Um, with, a, with blowing, you initially get phase one, uh, which uh, is a mechanical deflection of blood pressure up. And then blood pressure drops as cardiac output is blocked by that pressure. And that's during phase two, the Valsalva phase here. Um, as uh, your heart rate increases in response to that. That's the barrel reflex mediated by pressure sensors in the, in the large blood vessels. And um, that heart, the blood pressure recovers and it does not drop below, um, does not drop below baseline. That's phase too late. And uh, you, uh, that's, this is a normal response. You stop blowing, it mechanically deflects downward and then blood pressure uh, rebounds quickly up. That's phase three to phase four. And phase four shows this uh, kind of protracted increase in blood pressure above baseline mediated by systemic vasoconstriction even after heart rate has come back down. That's phase four. So this kind of uh, measures cardiovagal function. This measures adrenergic function or vasomotor function in the body. Here's an example of someone with autonomic failure. You see that phase two late never happens. It just keeps dropping. Heart rate doesn't really go up. It just kind of, uh, and uh, then afterward, the recovery of blood pressure is very slow. There's no vasoconstriction, just floppy blood vessels everywhere. Blood pressure comes up very slowly and eventually gets to baseline. Um, the tilt table is the most famous part of the autonomic evaluation. It's something that can be approximated at the bedside too. These large straps that we use are the most important part of the tilt table because they prevent the leg muscles from activating so that you don't have that contributing to venous return. You simply have the heart response and vasoconstriction in isolation. So in theory, there's some activation of leg muscles and core uh, musculature, of course, but that's the idea. Normally, your blood pressure doesn't change when you tilt up and heart rate goes up a little bit to help with that. Um, if you have low blood volume, you have pure failure of vasomotor responses, then the blood pressure drops and the heart rate goes up, but it's still not enough to keep blood pressure from dropping. If you have failure of everything, then you're going to get orthostatic hypotension. Your blood pressure drops by more than 30 millimeters mercury systolic. And your heart rate doesn't respond at all. In the case of POTS, your blood pressure doesn't drop, but heart rate goes up inappropriate, 
by 30 beats per minute or more with the tilt. And that's the definition of POTS really right now. It's just stable blood pressure, symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, and excess heart rate increment. Uh, here's an example of something else people talk about a lot. This is, you'll notice, we tilt them up, heart rate goes up quite a lot. It's going up by about 50, and then it just stays there and fluctuates, 50 beats per minute above baseline. As they're up there, they're getting more and more dizzy. They get here, they're saying, I feel like I'm going to pass out. Their heart rate then tanks. It drops in parallel with that. Blood pressure drops and pulse pressure drops. Cardiac output drops together and they faint. This is vasodepressor syncope or vasovagal syncope. We tilt them down and it quickly comes right back up to baseline. And uh, as they're laying down, their heart rate remains down near their original uh, supine baseline as well. That's vasovagal syncope. You can record this during a you know, uh, any tilt table test or even bedside, you can, you can um, look, but the, the CNAP monitor really lets you see this pattern of uh, in parallel heart rate and blood pressure and pulse pressure drop. The last part of the test is the QSART. Um, we measure at four sites typically. Here is the original QSART diagram by Philip Lowe, who was my teacher. And, um, you give the acetylcholine in the middle here, or here's the current uh, Q-sweat capsule, or you, I'm sorry, you give the acetylcholine here on the outside where it's iantifreezed by this cathode here, um, which you attach to a battery. And uh, you measure the sweating in the middle here. And by doing that, you're not measuring the direct sweat response, but the indirect sweat response. That's why it is a axon reflex here. Stimulating the sweat gland here, you're measuring at some other sweat gland over here. Another way you can measure pseudomotor function is heat the person up. You have to do this in a humid environment, so you have to make it at least 50% humidity, probably about 130 degrees. Do that for 20 to 40 minutes. Core body temperature will rise by one degree, and someone should sweat everywhere when you do that. If they don't sweat anywhere, the dye doesn't change purple and their denervated skin is revealed. Here's somebody who has global anhydrosis, except for their left foot. Um, some patchy anhydrosis. This might even be a medication effect. Here is uh, distal anhydrosis maybe a ganglionopathy perhaps. This is just your typical distal length dependent sensory motor peripheral neuropathy with stocking distribution anhydrosis. You can do this in a sauna. You can do it any way you'd like. This is how they do it at Mayo Clinic in this elaborate um, sauna with uh, that's hooked up to the um, air conditioning system of the building and they pump in humidity. Here's how I did it uh, in my own home. So this is uh, just an inflatable heated sack um, that we inflate and blow humidifier air into. Here is my young son who you can see is enjoying himself just fine even though it's 130 degrees in there and very humid and he sweat uh, on the powdered side of his body versus the unpowdered skin. Another way you can evaluate autonomic nerves is with skin biopsy, but I can tell you it's not very good. You can um, approximate autonomic nerves using epidermal nerves because they're another kind of uh, C fiber, unmyelinated fiber right there in the skin. They're easy to count. The rest of the nerves in the skin are just a mess. Look at that. They're so messy. How do you count those? There was a method put out, oops, well, I got ahead of myself, but it's not very good. Um, this is epidermal nerve fiber density over the decades, same as before, you can see it drops normally, but not nearly as much in the red patients who are normal compared to the diabetics uh, who are blue. And you can see that if you have diabetes, your small fiber nerves uh, will 
basically zero out sometime around age 60 or 70. Uh, then you lose all that um, fidelity of measurement. This is another look at the complexity of autonomic nerve fibers. This is a sweat gland in my thigh. And you can see that the autonomic nerve fibers just are, they're like a, uh, a dreadlock, uh, a um, rat's nest of nerves. Very hard to measure these nerves um, histologically. There are methods that are proposed such as this by Gibbons from Harvard. Um, they uh, blur the view of the sweat gland just to get an outline of it. And then they place a grid over it and say anywhere there's a nerve, but you can kind of see there are nerves all over, but they're counting some of them and then they, they uh, measure a density. But in my experience, it's very unreliable method. Uh, my patients have relied on it. Here's another view of the complexity of sweating. This is a camera focus down the QSART capsule while um, the acetylcholine is iantafreest out here to the sides. And I'll just speed it along. You can see the, the sweat pouring up out of the sweat ducts. Um, and it's kind of patchy actually. It's, and there's a lot of interest in um, whether this patchy kind of sweating might be more pronounced in someone with early neuropathy. They might put out, you know, more sweat from each gland, but have patches of, of uh, sweat loss. In any case, what you can see is that you can measure this without that pseudorimeter that I showed before, that big machine. This is simply a piece of scotch tape with, um, with uh, starch powder on it and iodine painted on the skin. As the sweat pours out, uh, the sweat spreads out across the scotch tape, turning it black. It works great. Uh, this is a published method that you can look up in PubMed that I put out with my old mentor, Dr. William Kennedy. This is another simple way to do it that you can do without a QSART capsule even. Here's a pipette tip, hold it down, put one end of a battery in there with a paper clip, fill this with 10% acetylcholine solution, turn on the battery. You're stimulating this one tip right here, but you get all this sweat response. This, I just pressed a piece of cellophane down with uh, the iodine spread on the skin. Take a picture of that. You can get a lot of information out of that. This is just a simple bedside test. It takes 30 seconds, 30 seconds pressing down on it. Here's a better view of it uh, using a video camera. You can see I'm stimulating right here. The sweat is spreading out all over. Take a simple picture of this at the end, measure the sweat volume. Um, that's a simple way to do it yourself, so to speak. So another view of it. Pretty neat. So this is a simple way to do an autonomic neuropathy test with great resolution. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop this share now and stop the recording and I'll take some questions. Discussion? Thank you very much. Yes? Uh, thank you, Dr. Adam, for this lecture. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, how are you? <laughs> Fine. Uh, can I ask uh, two questions? Uh, the first, uh, uh, what is your experience uh, about uh, pseudoscan, the electrochemical uh, conductance, its validity in uh, different pathologies? And second question, what is the most uh, sensitive and specific uh, heart rate test for autonomic neurons? What's the most sensitive and specific? For the neuropathy? Yes. 
how to evaluate was the bracing or, or uh, was standing or was Valsalva? Yeah, what's the most, uh, yeah, yeah, about your experience, what's the most sensitive and specific test for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the QSART, I would say, is very sensitive, but I would say it's less specific. And that is because it can be effective. You can suppress sweating with a lot of um, medications. A lot of medications have anticholinergic effects hidden, and patients may have taken something even two days before, and the QSART will be suppressed. The QSART response can be suppressed. So we have to ask those questions. Um, if I see a reduced QSART and I'm wondering, is this really neuropathy? <clears throat> then often and I'm not sure, then I'll follow up with a skin biopsy. I, I generally don't, um, I try to avoid over-utilizing one, um, one test. I try to use them um, in conjunction with one another. Um, the, uh, among the cardiovascular re responses, I would say that the adrenergic responses evaluated with the Valsalva maneuver are very sensitive for detecting um, autonomic dysfunction, and they're very um, clearly identified. There, there's no way to fake that. You can't, if you see a, um, a reduced late phase two, where blood pressure does not rebound during the Valsalva maneuver uh, fully, it's almost always some real autonomic failure, and it will become apparent in the other responses. But again, in the autonomic reflex screen, what's, what's so helpful about it to me is that you have heart rate responses, you have postganglionic pseudomotor responses, the QSART, and the adrenergic responses. And if you see something in, in isolation, I really need to see something dramatic to believe that it's true if there is no change in the other parts of the test. So, the autonomic reflex screen is very sensitive and specific when taken as a whole. Uh, any individual part of it is uh, perhaps less specific, and um, maybe um, if you take them in isolation, the, the individual parts of the reflex screen can, can fool you, can trick you into um, believing something is there. In this exact way, uh, for this reason, I don't do sweat testing alone. I always do it in conjunction with cardiovascular reflexes. Um, because if I see something, I want to try to corroborate it with other parts of the test. So the pseudomotor scan, or the, I forget what, the pseudo scan the, is a galvanic skin response primarily. Um, the same um, technology that's used in um, polygraph testing or lie detector testing. Um, you you can do that with a um, you can do a very similar test with a uh, with a EMG machine. Um, you simply place the um, anode or the uh, anode on the front, cathode on the back, um, ground somewhere else, and you're looking for a different potential. A lot of the software uh, EMG machine software can handle this. You're looking for a wave. Of, of increased potential um, after a stimulus, and that the stimulus is really uh, meant to be a startle response to elicit a fight or flight response, and you'll see a wave of of C fiber activity after that. Um, it's it's probably present during all of the nerve connection studies that we record, but it's just lost in the background. It's because it's so slow. You might see it actually, and if you were extend the view of your nerve connection studies, um, it is uh, what you're seeing is simply the the um, flood of sweat into all the sweat glands of the palm, which is very dense with sweat glands, and that creates this wave of uh, electrical potential. That's what the pseudo the pseudo scan measures, as far as I understand. That's a proprietary device, so they don't really show you what they're measuring. They just give you the pseudo scan uh, trademarked um, measurement uh, that it is abnormal or normal. Um, but it really is just measuring uh, the wave of sweat produced in the sweat glands in the skin. 
Um, so it's it's less, I would say, less specific. Um, it, it can be a nice test, though, to use. It's very fast and easy uh, and uh, painless, non-invasive, very good test. It's, very, it's, it's a very well-established test, the galvanic sweat response. Um, I like to try to couple it with as much as I can. Like I said, autonomic evaluation can be messy, so I'm always trying to convince myself something's real and I have to struggle with that. Um, it would take a little more time to do that, but it's, I think it's worth it to, when people are wondering what's happening to them. Patients want to know, what, what is this really? Is this really neuropathy? Is this autonomic failure? Is this POTS? POTS, of course, is uh, not necessarily autonomic failure. POTS is normal autonomic function that's just overactive. So it can exist without any autonomic failure, and it's by far the most common uh, diagnosis made in the autonomic lab. Thank you, Professor Adam. Next time, we'll see you in Egypt. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you.